Thanks, Jeff, for the introduction. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining this session. Um, so, as Jeff said, I'm a PhD student at the University of Warwick. I'm about to finish my PhD and also a visiting student at the Alan Turing Institute. Um, um, I'm working with Theodore Mulas, and um, today I'm going to be talking about causal Bayesian optimization, which is a, a framework that we proposed a couple of years back at this point. And uh, I'm going to also be talking more generally about how causal uh, Gaussian processes can be used for causal decision making. Uh, I believe this topic is very much related to the things that you've seen in the rest of the workshop, but uh, feel free, free to interrupt me if there are some aspects of the basic that I'm not covering and you haven't seen it in the past. Um, so what do I mean by causal decision making? Um, so with causal decision making, I refer more generally to the idea of integrating causal consideration into a choice process and take decision based on causal knowledge. And this is very important for several reasons, but in general, it allows you to reason about uh, the effects that of actions that you might take in an environment and how these will produce certain results. Uh, so for instance, if we look at this graph, which has been used in the past to analyze the causes of lung cancer, and this specific graph has been taken by the Book of Why, which is a nice introduction to causality, um, you might want to analyze whether, you know, uh, actually re reducing smoking um, uh, has an effect on lung cancer or whether, whether there are other aspects that are affecting this probability. Um, so there are a lot of like processes and systems in the real world that can be described by causal graph and can decompose in sets of interconnected nodes. And I'm going to give you some examples here. So this causal graph here describes the way in which different variables like airway population at different times and soil fumigants affect the crop yield. And in the in the in this discussion, I'm going to use uh, dash uh, edges to represent unobserved confounders, um, while um, shaded nodes will represent variables that can be intervened and manipulated. Related. This is only one of the classical examples used in the causality literature. Another example is given by this graph in which you have different environmental variables that are affecting uh, the level of uh, classification rate for a coral system. And in this case, you see dashed nodes, and this represents variables that are called non-manipulative and are variables that can be intervened on, uh, that can be observed, but they cannot be intervened on. Another example is given by this additional graph that describes in the way in which different risk factors affect the level of process specific antigen. So in this case, we have age, we have BMI, we have cancer, and these variables cannot be intervened on. We can only observe them, but we can intervene on the level of statin or aspirin drugs that a patient can receive. So we can identify some common elements in these examples. Um, so we have a system that is described by a causal graph, and I believe you saw, um, you saw it before. It's generally, you know, it's a directed acyclic graph or a DAG. Uh, we can collect observational data from the nodes that are not hidden, so observed nodes. We can run experiments either in reality or through the construction of a simulator, and each experiment has a cost that depends on the number of variables that we intervene on and the type of nodes we intervene on. So this, the research goal that we're going to look at is how we can efficiently find a system extract all of the possible information, especially because experiments are generally very difficult to implement. So looking back at the example that we introduced before, again, the, L, the crop yield graph, we might be interested in answering different questions. So we might be um, interested in learning how the crop yield uh, behaves given different intervention in the system. We might, wanna be, we, we, wanna, we might want to select the optimal intervention. Again, optimal level of L work population or salt fumigants optimizing the crop yield. And we might want to also draw some conclusions about how different causal effects are correlated in the causal graph. So for instance, let's say that in the past you have intervened on soil fumigants and you have observed the corresponding crop yield. How is this um, you know, correlated with an intervention and an alternative intervention that you might decide to implement in the future? Can we draw some conclusions starting from things that you've seen in the past? So in order to answer this question, we need to do three things. So first of all, we need to perform experiments. We need to integrate observational and observ in, in observational interventional data. And we, we might also want to transfer interventional information. And these things will become clearer as we discuss causal Bayesian optimization. Um, so in general, in order to find um, um, 
uh, the optimal configuration, the optimal intervention, we need to frame a, an optimization problem in terms of causal, uh, causal terms. And I'm going to give you a bit of a very quick background on things that about causal models that we need in this, uh, in this approach. So in the following discussion, we're going to consider a causal model. And the causal model is represented by a DAG, so the graph, and a four tuple. And in the four tuple, we have exogenous variables associated with a specific um, distribution. We have endogenous variables, and we distinguish between a target variable that we wish to optimize, a manip manipulative variables that we can intervene on, and non-manipulative variables that we cannot intervene on. And we have also a set of functions that are mapping each um, parent, the parents and the exogenous variable to, to the node. Um, so for instance, if we look at this x, y, c graph, that is the classic example of the existence of a confounder, observed confounder, so we have a causal graph on the left, and we have the associated structural equation model on the right, where we have uh, functions mapping exogenous variables and parents to the variable, where it, and each exogenous variable has a specific distribution. So when we speak about an intervention, an intervention um, means, um, so, so realize, uh, implementing an intervention means setting a manipulative variable in a causal graph to a specific value and is represented by the dual operator. Um, and so on the one hand, we have an observed universe. Um, so this is the observational universe. So um, it's um, you know, represented by the causal graph and the structural equation model. And we can collect observational data from the system that can be used to estimate the observational distribution. So this joint distribution of X, C, and Y. When we intervene, we break the causal relationship between one variable that we set to a specific value, so x, um, and we substitute uh, the associated um, equation in the structural equation model with a constant, which is uh, given by the intervention value. So when we observe these post-intervention universe, we collect what we, what we call interventional data that can be used to estimate the interventional distribution, which is denoted by this two operator. And this interventional distribution is actually the you know, object that we are interested in estimating because it allows us to reason about the effect of actions. So how do we infer this post-intervention universe, uh, sorry, uh, this, this interventional distribution in this post-intervention universe? Well, there are two different ways. Either we actually intervene in the system, we collect interventional data that can be used to estimate this these distribution directly, or we observe the system, we collect observational data, and then we use the do calculus to get an approximation of the intervention and distribution. So the do calculus um, refers to a set of algebraic rules that can be used to transform observational quantities to interventional quantities and estimate the interventional distribution. Um, not realizing directly an intervention. And generally, so for example, in this graph X, Y, C, um, with the do calculus, we can apply the backdoor adjustment formula to get the interventional distribution as the result of an integral computation. And generally, the do calculus uh, requires you to compute some integrals that are not available in closed form, so you'll need some approximations. Right. So. Given these you know, uh, causal, causal uh, terms and um, causal concept, uh, what we want to do in a causal optimization problem is we want to maximize or minimize, I'm gonna speak about minimization here now, um, a causal quantity. So we want to minimize, for example, let's say in the process specific antigen case, the target nodes, so the probability of health cancer, given a specific intervention. So what we wanna do is we wanna select the intervention variable. These are the um, excess is the intervention set. So for example, we want to uh, select statin drugs or we want to select aspirin level to minimize this causal quantity. And we want to select the intervention set and the intervention level. So what level should we set, for example, for statin drug? Um, so with, uh, with P of X, we give the power set. So these are all the possible intervention that we can perform in a causal graph. And the intervention set, the intervention level is instead considered selected in an interventional domain that is application specific and is generally fixed by the agent. So differently from a global optimization problem, in a causal optimization setting, we want to explore all of the possible intervention uh, and find both the intervention set and the intervention level. In a global optimization problem, generally what you do is you try to optimize a target variable manipulating all of the possible inputs. So you don't have the problem of selecting the intervention set, but you only have the problem of selecting the intervention level. 
So if we look at that, at the, uh, these two uh, optimization problem using a causal graph, on the one hand, in causal optimization, you will consider the graph on the left, where you can see that you have complex causal relationship between the variables, and you also have unobserved confounders, you also have no manipulative variables, so you account for the causal relationship. On the right, you see what uh, you know the corresponding causal graph that would be considered by a global optimization that would break all of the causal relationship between the variables intervening on all of the nodes. Okay, so one algorithm that is used for global optimization, especially when the target function is um, unknown, multimodal, expensive to evaluate or perturb by noise, is Bayesian optimization. And I believe you have discussed Bayesian optimization in the past um, talks, but uh, just in case, just as a, uh, as a reminder, in Bayesian optimization, what we do is we construct a surrogate model for the target function, and then we collect um, we collect uh, function evaluation according to an acquisition function, and then we evaluate the maximum or the minimum at the end, given our observed uh, function uh, values. So when we have exactly the same setting, so when we have a function that is again perturbed by noise, expensive to evaluate, um, or um, you know whose functional form is unknown, but we also have a causal graph, and we want to incorporate the data information that we have about the causal relationship between the inputs and the outputs, what we can do is causal Bayesian optimization. So causal Bayesian optimization generalizes Bayesian optimization in settings where we have a causal graph. And the idea is very similar. So what we want is we want to collect interventions, so function evaluation from some causal quantities, and, and we want to find the optimal among this function evaluation as fast as possible. Um, so the first thing that you might notice, so this is in general the causal optimization problem, and the first thing that you might notice is that exploring a power set uh, of all the possible intervention that we can perform in a graph is very expensive. Um, um, we can, however, exploit some properties of the causal graph, and I'm not going to go into the details of, of, of this, but in general, we can identify some invariances in the interventional space that allow us to reduce the search space. So that we, instead of like searching um, in the power set of all the possible intervention, we can consider only some intervention sets that are worth intervening on. So the, the, you know, the intuition here is that if I can reach the same results, so the same function value, by intervening on three variables instead of two, by intervening on two variables instead of, of three, then I should intervene on two variables because I'm going to pay a lower cost. So exploiting this, you know, properties, the first thing that we can do is reduce the, you know, the, 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 the computational cost of performing this optimization. Right, we are ready to, 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 to look at causal Bayesian optimization, and we're going to do that uh, by looking at a specific example so that we can visualize the functions that we wish to optimize. So let's look again at the toy example that we looked um, at before. Um, so we have x, z, and y. Here, all the variables are observed. Um, we don't have no manipulative variables. We don't have an observed confounder. And we have a specific structural equation model associated. And the first thing to notice is that the variable y is independent on x given z. So the intervention on x and z would lead to the same result as an intervention on z. And this is the sort of interventional invariances that I was speaking about before. So we don't need to actually explore x and z, but we can consider either an intervention on x or an intervention on z. And on the right, you see the functions that we're trying to, to target. So you see on the um, in this plot here, the expected value of y given that we intervene on x. And on the right, we see the expected value of y given inter we intervene on z. And what we're looking at, uh, where we're looking to find is basically the right level of the intervention on z. So these dashed, uh, the, the intervention corresponding to this dashed line that represents the minimum, uh, basically the intervention leading to the minimum value of y. So in order to do that, so we have these two target function and notice that indeed the intervention function related to uh, intervention on both X and Z has, you know, it's, it's invariant under different value of X. So it's some, the, the X dimension is something we shouldn't consider. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna place a surrogate model as you do in Bayesian optimization on each of these uh, target function. And the, the circuit model is going to be a Gaussian process, but who's, the prior distribution of this Gaussian process is going to be constructed by exploiting the two calculus that we mentioned before and using the observational data that we have collected from the system. So for each function that we're targeting, so in this case, 
intervention X and intervention Z, we have a, we're going to have a Gaussian process where the mean function is computed has the estimated expected value from the do calculus, which is this expression in orange. And the, the kernel function uh, is going to be an RBF kernel, a standard RBF kernel, but the variance of this RBF kernel is going to be inflated to reflect the fact that we might have some uncertainty on the Duke calculus computation. And this is because of this Monte Carlo evaluation and approximation that we might need to do to compute the Duke effects. So uh, if we look at this um, plot, the plot in this slide, you can see that in green, we have observational data. So these are the observational data observed for an intervention on X. Um, sorry, observational data collected from the system regarding X. Then we have interventional data. These are the red dots. And these are previous intervention that we have performed on X um, and for which we have observed the associated Y value. Um, in black, you see the true target function for an intervention X that we are targeting. In red, you see the prior uh, GP mean function, and in blue, uh, you see the prior, the posterior mean function and the posterior variance. So what you can see here is that the surrogate model is capturing the behavior of the function in areas where we don't observe interventional data. So for instance, between minus two and minus one. And this is because two calculus in this area gives us a very good approximation because we have observational data. So through this, causal GP prior construction, we have integrated interventional data and observational data, and we have, you know, correctly quantified uncertainty around the causal effects for X. And the same can be said for Z. So once we have constructed these um, surrogate models, um, we can see how, um, you know, these surrogate model um, differ from what we would get by using a standard GP construction. So if we use a mean a zero mean function and an RBF kernel, uh, the posterior mean function will be given by the, the, the blue line in the lower plot. And you can see here that the mean function is just passing through the data points that we observed, but it doesn't capture the behavior of the function in other parts of the input space. So that's, what, that's why we should use the causal GP prior construction. Now, once we have the surrogate model, we need to collect um, intervention. How do we select intervention? Well, we can expand the expected improvement acquisition fun function, which is a standard um, acquisition function using Bayesian optimization to select um, intervention across different sets. So let's say you have to select whether to intervene on X or Z. Um, you have your current best uh, value, which is this white star, and you're going to consider for every set the expected improvement. So how much we expect to get from an alternative intervention on, on X or Z. And we can find um, the optimal intervention by maximizing uh, the expected improvement across different sets. So there's a, a final element to consider. and, and this is um, linked to the fact that observing and not intervening might be the optimal thing to do in some example. Um, so we need to decide um, before actually deciding on which variable to intervene, we need to decide whether to intervene or observe the system. Um, so causal Bayesian optimization introduces what we call an intervention observation trade-off. So you know that in Bayesian optimization, you have an exploration exploitation trade-off. In a causal Bayesian optimization, you have also an intervention observation trade-off. And the way we address this is through an epsilon greedy criteria, which is inspired by the reinforcement learning literature. Um, so the idea is that at every step, you decide um, whether to intervene or observe based on an epsilon. Um, and this epsilon is computed looking at how well the observational data are covering the interventional domain. So let's say you're looking for intervention in between minus four, five and five for X and minus five and 20 for Z. And you can see that when you draw observational data, you collect them all in this area that is highlighted by this, uh, you know, is shaded in, in red. So that means that in order to understand what happens in areas that are not covered by your observational data, so for instance, X equal minus four and Z equal minus five, we need to intervene. So that's what this epsilon capture and is proportional is, is given by the volume of the convex all of the observational data with respect to the volume of the interventional um, interventional space. 
Okay, so we we can summarize uh, the causal Bayesian optimization algorithm in this in this algorithm. Um, so basically, what we do at every step, so we have a budget of function evaluation as we have in Bayesian optimization, um, and at every step we decide whether to observe or to intervene. If we observe, we just uh, observe the system. We collect observational data that allows us to estimate the calculus and so sort update of our prior distribution which will become progressively more accurate. If we decide to intervene, we decide where to intervene based on the expected improvement. Um, we then intervene in the system, we collect interventional data, and we update the procedure distribution of the function that we have decided to intervene on. So this, um, you know, this algorithm um, led to very good results in a variety of, of real world and synthetic settings. And I'm just going to show you one result here because um, it shed lights on, on different aspects of causal Bayesian optimization. So if we have a causal graph like the one on the left here, and we are looking for the intervention that optimizes Y, uh, we can run Bayesian optimization, we can run causal Bayesian optimization, and both of them can be run with a standard zero mean RBF kernel or the causal GP prior construction that we have discussed. And um, so the causal Bayesian optimization is represented by this black and green line. Um, in this case, we, we just explore different, different sets, explo uh, exploiting the interventional invariances that I mentioned before, but it doesn't really matter at this point. Um, you can see how causal Bayesian optimization converges faster than all of the other methods, and especially it reaches the red value. And notice how the red value is actually lower than the orange value. And this is because Bayesian optimization breaks all the causal relationship. It doesn't propagate the causal effects in the system. So the values of Y that it can reach are actually less optimal than what causal Bayesian optimization can reach. So not only causal Bayesian optimization is faster because you know, it um, selects intervention and intervenes on subsets for paying a lower price, a lower cost, but also Bayesian optimization doesn't get to the same result because of the blocking of causal propagation in the system. So we can, you know, identify some take home messages from all this. Um, specifically, many real systems decompose in interconnected nodes. And so doing a causal optimization requires intervening in, in the system and selecting the manipulative nodes, thereby, thereby solving a causal optimization problem. CBO, so causal Bayesian optimization, solves the causal optimization problem using Gaussian processes and improves Bayesian optimization when causal information are available, um, exploiting, exploring working intervention and using this GP prior construction that allows to integrate different sources of data. There's, there are various limitations of CBO, but two, um, one specific one, um, it uh, might lead to an explosion of the number of GPs that we need to actually run this algorithm. So what I told you before is that in order to optimize, to find the optimal intervention, we need to place a different surrogate model on every set that we wish to intervene on. So if you know the, the size of the causal graph um, grows, then the number of GPs that we actually need might be very potentially huge. Uh, in addition, um, suppose that uh, you intervene, let's say, on Z, um, the only Gaussian process, the only surrogate model you're going to update for an intervention on Z is the Gaussian process on Z. So there's no sharing for you're not efficiently exploring all of the possible information that you collect from the system. So let's look again at the causal graph that we introduced before, X, Z, and Y. And in this case, we said that we have three functions and we can get rid of one of this, um, that is the intervention X and Z because of the invariances. And what you can see is that you have an intervention on X, you have an intervention on Z, and you're placing separate GPs on all of them. But actually, again, this is not efficient because we are not exploiting all of the information and we want to find a methodology that allow us to transfer interventional information across sets. So it turns out that what we want to do is uh, we want to solve a multitask problem. Um, and you might have seen multitask Gaussian processes in the past. Um, so what we want to learn is we want to learn a set of function. Um, and you, there's a slight change of notation here. But uh, what we want to learn is we want to learn the causal effects, so the intervention function for all of the possible intervention that we can realize. And t of s here is the f of s that we were seeing before, and it's the expected value of y given that we intervene on x, x s. 
So we want to learn this join. We want to learn this function jointly. Um, we have some observational data from obtained from observing the system. We have some interventional data. Um, we want to define a join prior for all of this function and compute a join posterior so that we can do some prediction at and seen interventions. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to study the sort of correlation function that exists among these functions. We're going to then, based on this correlation that changes depending on, on the topology of the graph, we're going to define a joint distribution and we're going to then compute a posterior distribution. I'm not going to go into the theoretical results of this paper, but you can check there's a theorem uh, if you want to go into the details. Uh, it turns out that we can actually express all of the functions that we can define on a causal graph as an integral transformation of some base, what we call a base function. That is this red um, function here. So once you have identified the base function a causal graph, you can then do this causal, well, apply what we call the causal operator and get all of the remaining functions um, uh, through this integral operator. Um, so what is this base function? Well, this base function is a function that is again defined on the causal graph and is the expected value of the target known, given that we intervene on the parents and we control for the confounders. So the intuition is that once we have found this function, again, following the conditions of the theorem, then um, we have some mapping that is represented by this integrating measure, this orange uh, measure, that allow us to get all of the remaining functions. So instead of placing independent GP priors on all of the function, we can define um, consistent prior on all of the function by just placing a distribution on the base function. So this looks very complicated, but if we look back again at the standard, very small toy example that we were looking at before, what this means is that we have a base function and the base function is the intervention on the parent. So the only parents of Y is Z. So this F of Z is actually the base function. And then the other function, which is the intervention X, can be obtained as an integral transformation of this base function through an integrating measure that captures the relationship between Z and X. So all we are saying is that the, both the two functions that we wish to optimize in the system can be expressed by only a base function, only one function. Things get a bit more complicated when we look at causal graph where we have multiple parents and confounders like the graph in given here on the right side. So in this case, the base function is given by an intervention on E and D, which are the parents, controlling for the confounders that are A and B. Right, so given that we have a causal operator and all of the functions are obtained as an integral transform, we can place a causal prior, like the one that we defined before on the base function, and then propagate through this uh, causal operator. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to construct a causal GP prior, exploiting the do calculus and that's for the observational data for the base function. And then we can push them through the integral operator. And because of the linearity of the integral operator, what we obtain are GPs for all of the remaining functions with parameters that are determined not only by the data that we have observed for a specific set, but the data that we have observed for all of the remaining um, in, for all of the remaining sets. So through this construction, we can define a consistent prior and we can also exploit all of the interventional data that we have selected in the system. So at this point, using this model construction, if you intervene on Z, you not only update the surrogate model on Z, but you also update the surrogate model on all of the remaining functions, so the intervention on X. We still consider a likelihood um, that is Gaussian, and we can update, um, we can obtain the posterior distribution by standard cross form updates of GP regression. Right, so what we have seen in all of this discussion is that um, there are different types of data that you have can collect from a causal system, and depending on the type of data and the causal graph, you can um, do different things and come up with different circuit models that allows you to take decisions. First of all, if you don't have observational data and you don't have interventional data, there's nothing you can do apart from using a mechanistic model. If you only observe, if you only collect observational data, then you can use do calculus to get an approximation of the causal effects and then select the select action. If instead you have both interventional data and observational data, you can use a surrogate model. And the, the surrogate model, the form of the surrogate model depends on whether you want to come up with a single task model or a multitask model. 
If it's a single task model, then you're going to place independent GPs on all of the intervention functions that you're targeting and potentially incorporating observational data through the causal prior construction that we spoke about, getting what we call the GP plus, and that can be used then within causal Bayesian optimization. If instead the causal graph allows you to construct, to identify this base function, and I haven't spoken about the conditions for that, but if, if you can, um, then you, you can obtain what we, what we discussed before. So a multitask model that we call DAGGP because it incorporates the correlation structure uh, coming from the causal graph. And if you incorporate also observational data in the prior construction, you, you get what we call the DAGGP plus. Now, uh, let's have a look again for the same function, so the same X, Z, and Y um, at you know, how the DAGGP model performs. So on the left, you can see a comparison between a single task and a multitask model. In black, you have the true function, so the intervention on X. Um, and in red, you have the interventional data point that we have collected. The green line and the green shaded area gives um, the the multitask model, while the blue represents a single task model. And you can see that the, the a multitask model captures the behavior of the function in areas like, for example, around minus two, where there are no interventional data that are collected, nor observational data. And this is because of the information that are coming from, from alternative interventions. Um, on, the, on the right, you can see a comparison between a multitask model with a standard zero mean RBF kernel and a multitask model that uses the prior, the causal prior construction. And you can see now in blue, the observational data that we have collected for X. Um, the multitask model with the prior construction captures the behavior of the function around minus two, where we don't have interventional data, but also around minus two and Z and zero, where we have observational data. So it leads to a proper and uncertainty quantification around the causal effects, which is crucial for decision-making. Right, so um, you can decide um, in the paper that I'm gonna mention at the end, we've seen this, we've used this multitask model for just prediction of the function or within active learning. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna show you the results for when you use this multitask model within causal Bayesian optimization. So you do exactly the same things, you collect data using the causal expected improvement, you use the epsilon greedy to decide whether to observe, but you change the surrogate model to account for the correlation across intervention function. And in exactly the, the graph that we were seeing before, so the toy model and the more complex uh, gra causal graph with unobserved confounders. And you can see that the single task, the, the multitask model with causal prior construction converges and identifies the optimum faster than all of the, the alternative models. This also also for the real example. So here we have used the multitask model within causal Bayesian optimization to select the level of statin and aspirin that are optimal in minimizing the process specific antigen. And you can see that using a simulator, because in this case, we cannot collect uh, intervention, we cannot uh, do experimentation on patients, and we identify the optimal intervention in around five evaluations. Right, so for this second part, what are the take messages? Well, we've seen how the DAG GP model allows you to efficiently learn all of the causal effects in a graph and identify the optimal intervention faster when used within a causal Bayesian optimization framework. The DAG GP model allows you to capture the non trivial correlation structure existing among functions that are potentially defined on different input spaces and on different dimensionality, therefore enabling uh, a proper uncertainty quantification, which is crucial for active learning and also causal Bayesian optimization. If you want to read more about this, um, you can uh, have a look at these two papers. Um, and these are my collaborators. Thanks for your attention, and I'm open to questions. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Virginia, for the exciting talk. We do thank have you. a few questions. Yeah. Uh, so the first question is, uh, in Virginia's talk, the approach towards modeling causal relationship is from the point of view of uh, DAGs. In the previous yeah. talk by Andrew and Soren, they used potential outcomes. Is there a relationship between these two framework methods? Yes. Um, so you can actually map um relatively map one method to the other and there's an a, there's a 
very good paper by Guido Invans that compares the two approach. Um, generally, they have been developed in different fields. So the potential outcome framework has been generally used in social sciences and economics. And you have some assumptions like the unconfounded assumption that can be mapped to some properties of the causal graph. Uh, but there's an ongoing discussion about you know, the differences between these two methods and uh, whether one should use one or the other. Uh, in general, um, uh, the nice things about the dual calculus is that um, the, the, the DAG approach is that all of your assumptions are summarized in a causal graph that is a visual representation. And so it allows you to better understand whether the assumptions are behind your model. Um, and uh, apart from the backdoor adjustment, which is something that can be mapped to the potential outcome framework and to propensity score matching uh, methods, um, it has this additional front door adjustment formula that can be used for an observed confounder. And it's not very clear what is the you know, um, related approach in the potential outcome framework. So I would suggest you to go through this paper by Guido Imbens. I can send the link um, and it's a very interesting discussion about the two methods. Excellent, thank you. Uh, right, so the next uh, question is, could you elaborate on a few more practical examples of causal Bayesian optimization used in practice? Yes. Um, so. If we go back, um, so this is one practical example. So this is a practical example in which you have, um, um, this actually, this causal graph has been um, taken by a nature paper that is mentioned in the, in the causal based optimization paper. I'm sorry, one uh, second, Virginia, the, yeah. your slides are not shared yet. Uh, could you please get the slides uh, to the stream? Uh, Hold on. Uh, yes, could we please uh, move from the Slido being shown on the screen to slides? Yeah, excellent. You can continue, Virginia. Yeah, so, so this, this is one real application. Um, this is just one example in which we have a causal graph that has been taken from a nature paper that is also mentioned uh, in, in the causal based optimization paper. Um, and this is a real example in which you cannot perform experimentation in the real world, because we are dealing with patients, but we might construct a simulator, we have a structural equation model, and we wanna find what is the right thing to do, what is the right level of aspirin and static drugs that we give to the patient in order to minimize the process specific antigen. So this is an, a, a specific example. Another example was the one, the real example that I gave at the beginning for net calcification rate. So let me, let me have a look, let me see if I can find the... Yeah, so this, this is an example in which we have a lot of different variables that are affecting the calcification rate of a coral system. And it's actually an environmental you know, problem that is uh, you know, uh, quite important at the moment. And we have different variables that we can intervene on. Intervening on the system is very expensive. So we wanna select uh, very carefully the intervention that we implement. Um, the one that might lead to a minimization of the maximization of the coral um, of the coral reef, um, and so you know you you can you know incorporate all of your assumption about the system um, in something like uh, a causal graph, and therefore use this surrogate model for selecting the right thing to do. Um, there are a lot of other examples. Um, we have been using um, uh, the you know, these methods, actually a variation of this method for dynamical system to select the right level of um, inflation to select, the, to, to implement in order to minimize its unemployment rate. And there's a, there's a paper that is gonna come out quite soon. Um, so this is an, an example in the economy. Uh, you know, every time that you can represent the system with, with a causal graph and come up with some functional relations that you can estimate, um, then you can apply these methods. I have a follow-up question. Uh, yeah. personally. So it sounds very much similar to like uh, which arm to pull in a multi-armed uh, yes, band. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I guess here the difference is that there you have like discrete set of arms and here it's a continuous space you're working on? Correct, okay. exactly. So if all of the variables in your causal graph are actually binary variables, then you fall back to a, to a bounded problem. It's slightly different in the sense that in the bandits, you have a maximization of the cumulative reward generally, while in Bayesian optimization, you're only looking at the optimum of the function. So you're not reasoning in terms of cumulative reward. Um, but you could extend this approach. 
to be non-myopic. So if you think about, you know, Bayesian optimization is only looking at the one step ahead reward, the one that has the highest expected improvement, but you come, could modify it to look at the, you know, cumulative reward and it will get even closer to a banded setting. Excellent, thank you. Uh, a few more questions. Yeah. Uh, um, do GPs that use more, that use, that model do operate or become more computational expensive as compared to regular GPs? Well, the computational, I'm gonna go back to the slide. Um, okay, so the additional computational cost is in the computation of the prior. Um, and so, well, in general, no, because it's still a GP regression. Um, what you need to compute is the prior uh, and the prior depending on the causal graph and depending on the sets that you're looking at requires you to compute some um, integrals and and this depends on how you're going to approximate these integrals and whether these integrals are cross form which is generally not the case but in general the computation of the gp is still cubic in the number of observation. And you could uh, you know, uh, use um, a prox sparse approximation for GPs here. Um, and you can extend these methods, you know, tackling different dimension and one, the computational cost is definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. And uh, a few more questions. Uh, yep. Let me just mark them. I think, I think the two are similar. So yep. uh, Nicola, uh, I will, I wonder if it's uh, Nicola who also works with uh, Theo, maybe uh, uh, asks, what can you do if you don't know the graph? Smiley laughing face. And Auxas also <laughs> asks, what if you don't have a DAC specified? Are the methods to estimate DAC from observational data? So that's some, some <laughs> different question. Very good question, Nicola. Maybe you want to say something about it? <laughs> I'm sorry. So yes, that's, that's a big question. Um, the big question is uh, if you have an unknown graph and if you have an unknown graph, uh, then you need to account for any uncertainty on the graph. And so either, so there are two different things that you can do. He, either you run a causal discovery algorithm if we're running the, the, the algorithm and you come up with a plausible graph. Um, problem with that is that from the observational data, you can only select a graph within the Markov equivalence class and uh, you're not gonna come up with a unique one uh, or you construct your GP to account for a distribution on the graph. Um, and so account for the uncertainty on it and maybe collect data that are also useful in understanding what the real graph structure is. And if you use observational data, if I remember correctly, the, the second question is observational data. You cannot identify the graph uniquely. Um, so you're going to be able to identify graphs that are, you know, that involve the same conditional independence assumption, and uh, you need to do something more to distinguish among them. Mm -hmm. And maybe as a follow up to that, what if you do have uh, a DAG partially specified, mm -hmm. but you know that there are some unknown confounders on the DAG? Um, you mean unobserved confounders? Yeah, unobserved, unobserved. Yeah, yeah, so you can deal with that in the sense that as long as the, so there are two different cases. In general, we have, we have run the method with unobserved confounders. And if the causal effects are identifiable, meaning that the do calculus, lead, so you can apply the do calculus basically, then your prior construction still holds and you can use exactly the same method. The problem is when you don't, when you have unobserved confounders that make some of the causal effects non-identifiable. So in that case, you cannot use the causal prior construction, but you will have to, you know, revert back to a standard prior unless you use some sort of multitask. Um, that you know, in that case, in the multitask, you're gonna use the causal prior for some causal effects, the non-causal prior for some causal effects, but you're still still gonna get some information transfer from observational data because of the multitask nature of the model. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. And I guess the final question would be, yeah. uh, where can people maybe find some uh, more like uh, practical examples or maybe code samples where they could play around with it? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so the, the code is actually available for both papers online. And uh, you also have the, the data that you can play around for the real example that I've mentioned. Excellent, excellent. So I believe that would be all of the questions. Uh, so thank you very much, Virginia. It was excellent. Thank talk. you for the invitation.